My name is Kristina Kuliander and I am head of production and development here at the Swedish Film Institute. And I am so happy and honored that we are here today uh, and have the opportunity to take part of the work behind the success of Moonlight. I think that we all want to improve our work. And one way of doing it is to be inspired by others. Others that are generous to share their work and experience and how their process have proceeded, or maybe not sometimes. The Masterclass today is an initiative by Anna Lindström from Lucky Dog and the Swedish Film and TV Producers Association, I don't really know the word in English, and of course, Swedish Film Institute. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session, together with our international guests. And welcome to Sweden. So, hello. Hi. James and Adela. Hi. This is your first time here, right? Mm. In Sweden? Yeah. You chose a very good weekend for it. It's the first time we see the sun in a, in a long time and people still chose to come <laughs> inside the Thank cinema. Guys, so yeah. that says something about the, the way your film has reached the hearts and minds everywhere in the world. And we're going to talk about that today. And of course, you are here today because tomorrow is the Swedish Guldbagge Awards and your film is nominated as best uh, foreign film. <laughs> so... Um, <coughs> And, and if it's correct on IMDb, that would be your 214th award for the film if you end up winning tomorrow. And you have uh, nominations, over 250 nominations. So it's been uh, this is pretty... This important. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's been a pretty amazing journey that you, that you did. Is there a moment when you first realized, okay, we have something special here? Um, there were a couple of moments, I think. First of all, hi. Thank you guys thank so you much guys, for yeah. coming out today, um, even with the beautiful weather. I think, um, obviously, when the film was invited to Telluride, I think that was that's a, where a moment when we knew premiere. it was, yeah, the world so premiere that's was September at Telluride. September 2016. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that was sort of the first maybe indication that we had something, you know, special enough anyways that they would uh, in invite it. Because of the, the audience reaction or just the fact that you were invited to the... I think that festival has such prestige and they, it's a very, very small program. Mm -hmm. um, so it's difficult and a lot of so many people want to, you know, screen there. I think it's just very difficult and, and very, those slots are very coveted. Yeah. Um, so that was definitely um, sort of a, a sign. And then I, for me, um, the night of the Gotham Awards, which is a New York indie film award that happens, I think, well, it just happened. I think it's November mm -hmm. is when it happens. And it's sort of the first in the cycle of all the awards craziness. And we were nominated for a bunch of stuff and that was cool. But then we were there and we won. And we won like over and over and over and over. Um, and I think in most every category we were, we were nominated for, and like that was a special moment, mm. you know, where where it was bigger than just our our pride for the film and our feelings about the film, but like, oh, the community is also starting to tell us like this is a good thing. Sorry, I just I was stuck on my thing for a second, but I think I got it. <laughs> but that's me. I don't know what. No, James, I think that's what about true. You? Yeah, no, I mm -hmm. think that's all, all those things are for sure true. I think also <clears throat> those are the big sort of big picture signs of something that we felt very proud of, obviously. But I think, too, we could all, also recognize that in those moments, the first few days when we were on set filming and we could look towards each other, Barry, Adela, the rest of the cast, the director, and sort yeah. of feel very proud of it. It was like that was a more insular version of a, a special feeling, I think, yeah. that... We didn't realize by any means that we'd be sitting here in terms of that version of special, but I think we felt pr proud of what we were doing at, mm. in that moment as well. Mm. Yeah. So let's talk about the film, but I think we have to get it out of the way because otherwise people in the audience are going to sit and think about it. When will they bring it up? When will they talk about the Oscars? So let's just talk about it, get it out of the way, and then we can concentrate on the movie. 
Okay, so everyone knows what happened. If someone lived under a stone, I'll give a brief kind of um, version of it. So at the end of the Oscars last year, best picture, there was a mix-up of cards and Faye Dunaway read the wrong card that they had. So La La Land thought they won best picture. And I was watching it again yesterday and it's, it's almost three minutes until they actually understand or that it happens that the producer is a friend of yours, says, no, this is wrong, it's a mistake, you, act, you guys actually won. So what was going through your mind when that happened? <laughs> we're still figuring it out. I think we don't know the answer. We still don't know the answer. Um, no, I mean, I, I remember seeing somebody go, like, I remember seeing the guys with these things on kind of suddenly on the stage and thinking that was very abnormal. Um, but it was it was so incredible. And it's still sort of incredible, the idea that that, that kind of a mistake could happen. Uh, there's so many measures taken not to sort of to preserve the secrecy of the awards and then not, you know, to let a mistake like that happen. That I, I, I don't think I ever believed it. I was saying at lunch until the next day when I still had the statue and no one had taken it away. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, all right, I guess this is real. Mm -hmm. And of course you were uh, nominated. You had eight uh, nominations for the film, including Best Cinematography. And by this time you had already won two. So it was Maybe Maybe the mistake Ali for me for... too, but they're not correct yet. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you should go to Lena's house. Yeah, Lena should go to, the to me, yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> and of course, best adapted screenplay for, for Barry and, mm. and Terrell. Okay, I'm assuming that everyone has seen the film. Is there someone who hasn't seen the film? Okay, so it's like less than 10 people. So, spoiler alert, we're going to talk about the film. Sorry. Uh, and of course, you get the chance to see it or see it again at 4 o'clock. But let's start with uh, watching the trailer to kind of get into the mood of uh, Moonlight. So you can play it now. Totally gives you the shivers. Wow. And when I, I rewatched it um, last week, because we were doing this talk, it was even better than I remembered. So thank you so much for making this movie and, and for coming here. Uh, it's a real dream come true, I think. Not only for, for me and the people arranging it, but for everyone here in the room. So let's talk about the process. This is a movie that uh, had a budget of 1.3 million dollars, so that's less than kind of a medium, semi-low budget Swedish film. That's not a lot of money. Yeah, it wasn't um, a lot of money for us either. But uh, you were very instrumental in it happening. So you were, you met each other and Barry in film school. So the, Barry Jenkins, the director and screenwriter. And then I've heard different kind of semi-negative words like pushy, persistent, and so on. It was a lot of your making that the movie actually happened. Could you tell us about that uh, I think I think you're referring to um, Barry and how he describes yeah. um, my insistence that he make another movie. Um, yeah, we've all known each other since we were like 18 or 19 years old. And of course, Barry and James made this beautiful film, Medicine for Melancholy. And then um, I think, you know, there was a lot of <sighs> expectation for what could happen af after that film, on the, you know, on the success of it. Um, and, and certain things had never really materialized. And all of a sudden, so many years had passed and Barry hadn't made another film. And so I did call him and say, like... It's time to make a movie. You're going to make a movie. So help both of us. And I'm going to, you know, see that, see through that process with you. Whatever it takes, we'll figure out, you know, what the film should be. And eventually, of course, the, this is what the film ended up being. Mm. And uh, from what I gather, Barry had a lot of different kind of ideas for his next. Because this yeah. was to be his second feature, <laughs> which it is. But uh, did you help him kind of sort through those? How did you end up with this? He, so it's based on an unproduced play from a, a playwright in uh, Miami, Terrell McCraney, who is a genius, um, lit literally an ordained genius via the MacArthur Genius Program, which is a granting organization uh, in the States. And he and Barry grew up both in Miami, both... Um, actually in the neighborhood where the film is set and, and always within a few blocks of each other, but didn't 
ever meet, um, even though they were occasionally like at the same schools and again, like, you know, just a few blocks away going through very similar experiences uh, growing up, you know, with without a lot of money and with moms who were addicted, you know, to crack cocaine. And um, anyway, so when this piece was shared with, with Barry, even though it wasn't, uh, as far as like the, the coming up gay in the neighborhood part of it, wasn't something he immediately connected with. There was so much else about it that was really personal to him. Um, so yeah, so we did talk about, I don't know, maybe... Ba Barry is not gay, but the screen... The correct, guy yeah, Barry is straight, Trill is gay. Yeah. Um, and we, we had like a list of maybe a, a dozen or so different ideas for what could be the second feature, and Moonlight was on that list. And I think there are some things on that list that might come back around. We might still make those movies, but for the time, this felt like the place to go mm -hmm. in that it was small enough, contained enough, and deeply personal while still feeling a little bit at, at arm's length because it wasn't his immediate personal story. Mm -hmm. I was looking at interviews, and apparently he went to Brussels and wrote the screenplay in 10 days. Yeah. Yeah, and he came back. <laughs> So what were your thoughts on that screenplay um, you got in your hands? Well, I think we both... Did you read the first draft or did I just read that? Mm, I don't remember. <clears throat> I don't know Not if sure. we let you read it. But it was... Um, it, it, the first draft w wasn't so very different from the, from the finished film. Um, I remember being deeply moved by it. Uh, and I think like moved to the point of tears off of a first draft of a story about people that couldn't be farther from my own um, upbringing. And so then um, we did a little bit of work, you know, and, and I think I was telling you like the process of revision was less about um, revision and more about omission. There was kind of a lot more in the first draft that ultimately felt um, maybe like repetitive in terms of, you know, the beats and, and trying to find that balance between all three chapters. Um, so it was less about an overhaul of, of, of the script and more about like redaction, mm -hmm. I think. And, and how did Plan B, which is Brad Pitt's company, come on board? They, uh, so they had seen Medicine for Melancholy and were fans of Barry's, like many people, um, and had continued sort of a, a co conversation with him over the years. And um, they, you know, they called us up. We were sort of in the process of putting the movie together. We were talking to a few different, you know, finance uh, partners. And they called us up and said, you know, we love this and we'd love to be a part of it. And, you know, as a, as a younger producer, I mean, you don't really say no to that kind of an invitation to, to partner on something. And yeah. so, yeah, from that point forward that, you know, after they came on, then, yeah, Anna, uh, sorry, A24 got involved and then yeah. from there it kind of had momentum. Yeah. And you were working with uh, two producers. So one of them, of course, is the... Uh, what's her last name? Didi, Didi Gardner. Uh, yeah, yeah. Who, who won an Oscar for 12 years as a slave. She so is a the force. Only woman yeah. who's won two Oscars as um, main producer. Um, so I was, w when you think about the construction of the, of the film with these three acts, that, of course, most films are three acts, but this is very obvious to anyone that this is actually three because it's three different time zones and most of all, three different actors. Mm -hmm. So, What were the conversations like when you got the screenplay and saw, okay, so this is the construction of the film, how do we deal with this? Yeah, I mean, we we naturally talked about like how to cast the three parts and it wasn't always assumed that it would be three different actors. Um, I think the more sort of conventional like Hollywood way to do it would be a child actor for the uh, little story and then you find someone that can play Chiron and, and Black. Yeah. Yeah. Um, It's more efficient, it's more controlled, it's easier on your schedule. Um, but ultimately, we don't ever like to make things easy on ourselves. So <laughs> we decided that it really should be three distinct um, performers because the characters are three distinct characters. Um, and so that's kind of how we arrived at that. And then, you know, found, found uh, Little is a, a very talented young man named Alex Hibbert that actually grew up grew up in Miami, it was local to the area, um, and then the other two came out of Los Angeles. Mm. So how involved were you in the casting process? Well, I love the casting process, um, So, and I was still at, at that time able to, the way my schedule was, be very involved, and um, we made like three or four trips to Miami where we would have these open casting calls. Um, 
which uh, is sort of a, th a thing I've done a lot when you don't have the money to pay a casting director properly to do it. And also when you're looking for talent um, that's a little bit outside of, of what is normally being requested. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a noticeable movement towards diversified casting, but at the time and before that, like there just weren't a lot of young black kids on tape that you could consider. Um, so yeah, we would do these like open casting calls in schools and community centers and, you know, anyone that would have us. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the and then that's how we found Alex. Yeah, like yeah. he just came in one day, um, he was uh, a student of a teacher who thought he was really talented, sent him in to see us and because she saw that we were doing this casting. Mm. That's how we found him. This is maybe mm. more a question for, for Barry, I guess, but maybe you can you can answer it uh, either one or, or both. But the, the thing with continuity and, and three different actors, because they feel like the same person. It's something they about the, the, the body language, about the, I think it's a lot in the eyes. Mm -hmm. Um how how do you work with something like that with continuity getting them to be the same character yeah it's um i know they don't actually look like the same person but i always believe that they are the same person and i think it has everything to do with the performance that Barry drew from them as far as maintaining what he the continuity that he believed needed to you know persist across chapters and then i do think I mean, if you look at this poster like that, those eyes to me could be the same man, even though we know they're three different people. Mm. Um, so I think there's a lot of power in in their eyes mm. as far as carrying that suspension of disbelief across the whole film. Mm. I think I need to like take something's not right about this. <laughs> you guys hear it? It keeps like being Clicking. weird. <clears throat> yeah, okay. you're not really hitting it, so I don't know. I don't what, know is, what is the technician saying? <laughs> you want to check what it? am I doing I'm wrong? I'm going to ask James some questions, fine. so if you want to check it out, this is actually a perfect <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll be right moment back. For, for that. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so James, when, when you got this, uh, uh, in your work as a cinematographer, you, you worked with Barry uh, before yeah. uh, in a couple of shorts and, and his um, feature debut that was mentioned. Medicine for Melancholy. So what's the first thing you think about when you get a, a screenplay? Okay, this is what we're going to shoot. It's funny. So, yeah. So like she said, we've been talking, we went to film school together. And I think the truth is we learned to make films together. And so because of that history, there's a very similar vernacular that we both share when we approach a project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, we would share on weekends or weekdays watching films together and discussing them kind of obsessively for the years we were in university together. And so there's just a very quick shorthand that we share. And um, by no means am I saying it's the same thing because we both come from very different places, but there's a, we share this very particular part of our lives together that's unique. And I think that for that reason, there's a, a, common, a common language that we share in that mm -hmm. regard. Um, but yeah, to, uh, you know, what is the first thing I think about? You know, I think about uh ex how to hope the audience experiences a film i think that's something that i think about a lot when i'm reading the various work together for the first time where i'm kind of reverse engineering it i think i start with what i hope an audience or what you know in this case what i feel like i want to feel towards the end of the film and i think that mostly evolves into what the tone is what? Welcome back. Thank you. My my head is too small. That's the answer. Oh, okay. Mine is massive. Um, so I think it's the t like tone, mm -hmm. emotional chords, and yeah. things like that. Those are the first things I start to think about, and you know, I think that's the beginning of our pre-production process, and then by the end of the pre-production, it's about sort of the technical aspects of it all, deconstructing so things. So let's talk a little bit about which films you were watching and discussing in the pre-production of this film. Do mm -hmm. you have some inspirations? Yeah, titles, the, <laughs> directors, cinematographers. It's funny. I think I, I think we're very simple men, both Barry and I. <laughs> we tend to go back to the, the same filmmakers every, each and every single time. I think we're stuck in many ways. Um, and so I think what's true for the first films we were making back in university, and what was also true in, in Moonlight, were the very similar. Uh, which 
probably are obvious if you've seen the film in many ways. I mean, Wong Kar Wai was actually was pretty massive for us. Mm. Uh, Claire Denis is a pretty huge uh, influence on us as well. Um, I'd say those two are the biggest, but mm. there's obviously other ones like Spike Lee and, and, and like you know, Clockers, et cetera. There's a lot. But mm. those are the, I would say that from, from my perspective, I would say that Wong Kar Wai, Claire Denis, and, and Spike Lee are probably the top three. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Yeah, and I, I know the movie has been compared a lot to In the Mood for Love, <laughs> yeah. the Wong Kar Wai movie. Yeah, no, there's, there's a bit of, there's some silence and the way the camera sort of moves and its pace is, you know, very tip of the hat to, to that mm. film. Mm. So do you want to elaborate a little bit about um, the use of, of uh, light versus darkness and the use of colors in the movie? Because it, mm. it has a, you're talking about tone and feeling. Or maybe let's backtrack and, and uh, talk about how did you discuss what kind of tone and feeling you want to have in the movie? Because the story could be told in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I don't really like the phrase poetic film language because it can be kind of like a nonsense thing, but mm. this is really poetic film language, I think, in this movie uh, and very beautiful and unique. So I guess you wanted to do it in a way, but how did you talk about it before you started the production? There's so many parts. I mean, for, for my, from where I sit in the, in the sphere of things, it was a lot about... Um, less to do with telling a beat by beat by beat narrative and more attempting to create an experience. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where the power of the photography kind of comes into play a little bit for the film, where um, the hope is that you're not just you might as well not just read the story from a book or a play where it comes from originally, but Hopefully that by the end of the film you have uh, felt like you have been in those shoes and um, on the same journey that Chiron has gone through for his life. And I think the hope was that by the way we move the camera and by the the colorfulness of things, by the harsh and sometimes soft lighting, depending on the mood we were trying to strike, I think that was the hope was to create that experience that was hopefully more impactful than just sort of watching reality or a version of reality mm. yeah yeah i don't know does that make sense mm. <laughs> it does one okay. thing which i think is a very interesting aspect is well it's the the play it's based on uh, it's called um in the moonlight black boys look blue mm. and uh the character is even called black in the in the third installment and so it's it's quite dark uh, mm. skinned uh actors playing the the main role so that is um that's a challenge right i mean because what i understand mm. cinematography is kind of based on well the skin tone needs mm. to look good but then it's kind of taken for granted that that skin tone would be yeah. pale like like me so how do you light yeah it's funny black actors <laughs> I've I've been asked this question a few times in the last year. year but it's so. okay to ask. No, right? no, it's like, 100% uh, okay. It's just it's, it's okay, fascinating right? to me because it is something. I since like I said a minute ago that I I learned to make films with Barry uh, when I didn't know anything about making films or photography or cinematography. I was on that journey with the, my friend Barry, who obviously makes films with people of color in it. So mm -hmm. for me, it was along the same lines of just learning photography generally was mm. was was about learning how to photograph and and light and care for these people that have a different sort of hue of skin than I do so it's it's I find it challenging to answer the question because it sort of came in the same moment as learning the craft generally did mm. um of course, there's technical things that you do differently to, i you know I would light myself differently than I would light black obviously so it's different technically but it I, i it doesn't it felt going into moonlight not a big hurdle to jump mm -hmm. over it just felt like i was doing another movie with barry mm -hmm. um i think talking about what technically it is it's probably pretty boring for the that's audience. more for maybe cinematographers <laughs> in the audience but, I think but it but yeah the, the, the history of the of how it came to be was very natural it wasn't a a, a thing that barry and i had long long conversations no, about no, no, truth no. be told no. it was just like making another movie with my friend. It, it takes place in, in uh, Florida and it's uh, quite, um, I mean, it's, 
it's not a happy go lucky story it's it's quite grim in its places how how did you think about that with sunshine darkness <laughs> like how to express that in the in the cinematography yeah it's in, oh, it's interesting i think the um the colorfulness the harshness of the the light in florida i think adds a great deal to uh, the tone we were trying to strike, which was a, uh, a tone of strength and of boldness and a tone that, while I think the characters are going through this very vulnerable time in their lives, to, as from a photography standpoint, try to present them as hopefully you hope they might feel in this very hopeful sense of strong, strength, like I said, and and powerful contrast and things like that. So, and then that, that also goes to this, the other side of my job, which is the camera work uh, in terms of the lensing and choosing to shoot it in the anamorphic ratio and trying to present a different kind of scope that would be applied to what is maybe a, you know, you could describe it as a nuanced or subtle drama, but to present it in a way that is on the same or a similar scope to an action movie in Hollywood, for example, with the same sense of power. It was, I think, the way we're trying to sort of present the material. Well, so I think the, the colors and the light go along with that. Yeah, and to just jump off that, I think there's this thing that happens a lot with poverty porn where it's like very gritty or very sort of like, you know, desaturated and gray mm -hmm. and like sort of sad feeling. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think I've heard you mm -hmm. talk about this or Barry talk about this before where you don't, Growing up in that environment, you don't see your world as like gritty and washed out and blue and sad. Like you see a bright, green, vivacious, like you're growing up with all the colors. It just so happens, you know, in a, dis, a disadvantaged situation, but you don't experience your world the way that a lot of filmmakers like throw your world up on screen. And mm -hmm. I think you guys are trying to mm -hmm. be honest to that experience. Yeah, again, coming from like the character's journey of, of what they're going through, not a like a filmmaker's journey of applying that to the characters, mm. more so what the characters want to bring to us and present themselves this way. Mm. The main character is very silent. They even make a lot of jokes about him never talking and so on. It's quite a quiet and silent film in general. How did you discuss the importance of, of silence? I mean, this is a kind of for the sound editor and the, the composer, but still, I no. Mean, but even at the script level, it was yeah. a quiet movie. That yeah. you know, even even on the page, there wasn't a lot of dialogue, and it was always about reminding ourselves to to stay comfortable in that space mm -hmm. and and have confidence in that um, in the silence and the power of the silence because I think. It's easy to both either as, a, as an actor or for Barry as a director or for me as a producer watching the monitor on set, like you might start to question whether it's okay that no one's talking. And we kind of just had to always, t till the moment we lacked picture, like remind each other the silence is a good thing. Mm. So For me, it's also when I read a script like that where I can see more description than dialogue, it's also a very empowering thing for my role to, to say, well, this is where I get to sort of speak out loud in a way that maybe otherwise might not be afforded to me as a cinematographer. Mm. So it's a, for me, it's, I'm, I'm always excited when I read scripts like that, that, that want <laughs> no something dialogue, more for me. No dialogue, only expression <laughs> in pictures. That's yeah, perfect. I mean, you want to balance, obviously. Yeah. But. An emoji script. <laughs> that's my next project, exactly, yeah. yeah. Not the emoji movie, but yeah. <laughs> Two. <laughs> can, can I, how many people in the audience are filmmakers? I forgot to kind of ask just to... Oh, wow. Have, wow. Great. That's awesome. That's a big wow. ratio. Okay. Cool. So they do want to know actually cool. how to light. Yeah. On, on detail. <laughs> now you can start talking about the lenses. <laughs> <laughs> and we will open up for... There's going to be plenty of time for, for questions, so you can, you can actually ask super specific questions. Mm. Uh, then I think um, the I think the, a big part is of course uh, the music, as in every movie, but especially in this movie. And and for example, the the scene in the in the first part where they're playing uh, soccer mm. with the classical music, it just kind of turns this normal thing into this amazingly <clears throat> beautiful scene. So, uh, could you elaborate on the on the music? As best I can. Unfortunately, Nicholas Bertel, our composer, would be best suited to speak on it. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, the Barry had a, um, a playlist that he shared with us in prep um, that was sort of his inspiration through the writing and then the, the prep process. And I would say probably about half that music actually ended up as uh, cues in the film. Um, and we were really fortunate to meet Nick Bertel, our composer, uh, early in the process. He had been working with Plan B on some stuff, and they thought, well, this might be a good fit. Why don't you guys just, you know, have an initial conversation? So so him, uh, Nick and Barry were, were already, before we started shooting, I think we'd yeah. hired awesome. him. And so they were able to have a dialogue about music and feeling um, before we even, you know, shot the first frame. So I think mm -hmm. it was really... And, we, and we're working with Nick again on the new movie, so that relationship will carry forward. And I think um, he's very gifted, clearly. <laughs> yeah, obviously. <laughs> yeah. We talked a little bit about the, the awards in, in the beginning, which, of course, say something. But most of all, that it, it resonates with people everywhere. Uh, what do you think it is in the movie that makes it struck such a strong chord? Um, I mean, I, I honestly feel like it's the humanity in the piece. Um, it, it taps into feelings, um, that each of us have had, you know, in, in our own specific way. I mean, I've had, um, specific uh, feelings about, you know, not belonging to something or, or being an outsider to something that's different from, you know, Chiron's exact experience of otherness, but, uh, it's relatable and you take it in and you kind of metabolize it and make it your own. And, um, and that's what got me on the page when I first read it. And I think that's what gets people when they experience it, you know, in the audience. Yeah. You know, I agree. I think it's the specificity of it and how unique it is. It is, it, it is to, um, that particular, not only part of Florida, not only part of Miami, but a particular part of Miami, uh, and how specific Barry has written it and then now depicted it, I think it's that power that allows, you know, everyone to sort of, I don't know, I think when you see specificity, all of a sudden you see universality yeah, as well. Yeah. And so there's definitely that is happening throughout that film, the, the film for sure. And some, some ability that when we break ourselves down to the smallest molecule, um, we became, we become the most relatable, which is obviously a strange dynamic. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So let's actually uh, now we can see if there's there's any questions. We can take some questions in in between. So th here's one. I think you you have a mic that you're going around with. Hi, uh, my name is Joshua, and I'm a musician. Um, so as a, I have two questions, is it okay to? Please, we have time. Yeah. Uh, as a creator, you want to make corrections when you're watching your own creations um, over and over again. And finally, you have to say, stop. This is the end of it. We're going to release it. But after you release it, have you felt that you want to make certain corrections within the movie? Barry, Barry uses the phrase pencils down a lot. Like he'll ask me, because we, we, we have a lot of different things that we're working on together. He'll ask me like, when is pencils down? Because to your point, like he does want to, up until the very last moment, continue to um, work on it and improve it. Uh, and so I think you kind of have to make peace <laughs> with that and know that you will forever and ever glimpse small things that you wish you could go in and you know tweak ever so slightly. Um, but I mean, we did, we were fortunate to do a little bit of work between the festival release and the theatrical release in the States, um, just, uh, sonically, like we went in and did a little bit of sweetening with, with some of the score, um, and some of the audio and stuff, but I kind of, I kind of just have to, I mean, I don't know how many things drive you crazy or keep you up at night, but I think, you know, <laughs> For me, it's the opposite. I mean, I mean, yes, of course, there are things that I have difficulty with. Um, but my role is different in that regard. I, I have to let go the second Barry calls cut. I'm, it's over. I got, he calls cut, and I'm my, I have to let go immediately at that very specific moment to say I'm no longer, I no longer have authorship over this at all. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was kind of awesome watching the trailer again with you guys before this conversation because I haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. in a year maybe and I haven't seen the movie in, in a similarly long time so it was kind of wonderful to be reminded 
of how the movie makes me feel. Um, I think that we, I mean, as you pointed out, we didn't have a lot of resources financially, which translated into not a lot of resources technically. And so we had to embrace the flaws in the, in the piece, um, which was also kind of... She looks to me when she says that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, so I think that uh, it was... No, no, no. It's it's beautiful just the way thank it you, is. Thank you. Thank you. To to um, it was I, what was what was so surprising, and I think sort of a, a, I was it was renewed in me to watch the trailer with y'all right now was that this thing that we always knew had a lot of flaws and rough edges, and to have it kind of ascend to the place that it did in in the culture and in terms of the acceptance of it and the critical acclaim. Um, yeah, I, it's full of flaw. It's full of mistakes, but we love them, you know. I think also within those mistakes too, it becomes very personal. They're my mistakes. They're Barry's mistakes. They're the actors' mistakes. And those, I don't know. It's like uh, it's the flaws that we remember the most, but they're also the most charming. I think both in film and in our lives generally. Um, so you own them, I guess, really, and you have to own them and be okay with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the second one? Yeah, the second one is about dialogue. And because for me, as a musician, I work with my, work with my brother. And we have constant dialogues about the, about the pieces and about the whole structure of the song and all that. So you have to remove your ego. Uh, but for you, as a creator in, in movies, you have a bigger team. Yeah. And you have to remove your ego much more quicker and... Um, my question is, how do you do that? Or, and if you have a dialogue about something that you don't like or like, how can you be certain that it's not the ego driving the idea that more is more your passion or about storytelling that is driving your idea? I mean, I have two thoughts about that. One specific to this film, and then one more more broadly, just kind of how I get through my day to day, but, um, because we've known each other so long, the, the core creative team on this movie, there is a level of trust and a foundation, I think that goes back so far that we aren't afraid, I guess, to make mistakes. And we really deeply believe and, and know that whether it's James or Barry or our editors, you know, um, who also went to school with us that, uh, nobody's ever trying to tear you down. Like it really is about supporting and encouraging one another. And so it's a very safe place to fail. And I think that um, consequently, like it's sort of an egoless space. And I think that's why the relationship with Plan B worked so well for us too. Um, because that could have been. Because Brad Pitt's ego is so small. Pardon? <laughs> What'd you say? I missed His the joke. Said Brad, is... Brad Pitt's ego is so small. Well, no, I just mean like I I could have felt very afraid, you know, yeah, yeah. going into that partnership of being um, overpowered by some very powerful people. And instead we said we're going to, li- you know, link arms with these guys and trust them and kind of like step off the cliff. And um, so that's specific to this movie. But then I think in life I try to be unafraid because I think that the ego really comes from a place of fear and insecurity and if you can remember to always move forward with with without fear um, I think you can have a better career and a, and a better life and it's a hard thing to do but that's kind of yeah that's how I do it how do you do it James hmm. it's difficult I mean uh with you and your brother, it's just two people in a, I mean, maybe in a room of, of with more, maybe more band members, but on a film set, even in a small film like this, there's a good 50 or so people around. Um, and with a spectrum of personalities and a spectrum of egos and to find a way to still be vulnerable when 50 people are around is a challenging thing to do for anyone, I think. And I think when you have partnerships like Adela was talking about before, you feel comfortable letting your guard down and b- 
being okay to let them see you at your worst place. I mean, there's a picture of me that I have on my phone <laughs> that Adela knows that of me at the very at the wrap of day one oh, yeah. of production. And Would I you just guys look, like to see it. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad I smashed my phone this morning on the way here. So I, I I look drained and exhausted and I'm like I'm sitting on the dolly just kind of bent over like this <laughs> after the first day because <laughs> the first day was the day you're talking about before with the in the what the, did you shoot the, then? it was the football the, the, the football scene, scene oh. when the kids are playing and it was it was hot I don't do well in the heat <laughs> you know and I just was exhausted and felt like oh, I made a real mess of that um but <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is Adela didn't make fun of me afterwards, <laughs> and neither did Barry. And um, you know, I think that just makes you. But feel I took the picture so I could make fun of you later. Later, like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it may, no, you work with people like this that are let you be your worst self, and it somehow makes it okay to be your best self later too. Yeah. Well, yeah. and to the idea of like the film ecosystem, I mean, like I have a specific way that I give notes to directors so that they don't feel mm. on the spot in front Please, of a crew. Stella. Well, no, I mean, you try, you, it's, I mean, it's, it's, there's, it's, I couldn't figure out the formula if I try, but it has to do with kind of like always being present so that when you do have a, an idea to share or a question to ask or a note to give, you can kind of do it in a way that doesn't disrupt the, it doesn't feel like, oh, now the producer's suddenly on set. It's like, mm. no, I've been there the whole time. And now I have a thing to say, and I'm just going to like try to very quietly without putting you on the spot, like, mm. you know, whisper this to you without stopping the flow of the action or making you feel like everyone's looking at you like, is he going to do what she said? Is she going to do what she said? You know, like it's just make mm. it a comfortable, safe space to. Is, is that a normal way that the producers I mean, come in and show their power? I have no idea. I always say like producing is kind of like sex. You have no idea how anyone else is doing it because you don't. <laughs> That's you don't great. work with other producers, right? Like I've worked yeah. with a lot of cinematographers and I've worked with different directors and, you know, all the different crew people. And I, but I don't generally work with other producers. I have no idea what they're doing, but yeah. that's what I do. So, yeah. yeah. So how many shooting days did you have for the film? Um, I think it was 25, yeah. 25. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's take the next uh, question. Uh, My name is Julia, and I'm a screenwriter and a director. And I was wondering. This film was in Cannes uh, this year. Oh, uh, congratulations! Yeah, I, I met Barry, and it was uh, wonderful to just. Uh, um, but I didn't answer, uh, ask any questions because I was nervous. <laughs> um, now you have your chance. <laughs> <laughs> now I have a chance. But I, I was wondering, James, if you could maybe you want to share like a sp special moment or situation that you remember. From the set, or your you and your you your and Barry's you and Barry, you, I, your um, collaboration, uh. and like because you say you have a common language mm. that you built up, but if you don't have the possibility to have like a s long time relationship yeah. with your cinematographer, do you have any like advice or like how do your process look very very practical? Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> it's that's hard. Obviously, mm -hmm. I, I think we all struggle with that as filmmakers to try to find ways to like what's the shorthand to within. I, I know how it works here, but it, within the U.S., to, we have our pre-production process where you're hired on, and within a few weeks, you have to become best friends with this person somehow, and you have to find a way to speak the same language within moments of each other. Uh, so yeah, not everyone can benefit from the kind of history that Barry and I have had. You know, I think. It's like dating. You have to find a way to get to get to know them quickly, and to find a way to understand what what makes them excited and what, what that doesn't work. Um, but I don't have any shorthand. It's it's there's well, no. I think I can I can I mean one of your gifts is that you're just such a um, like phenomenal communicator. Right. Other so than I think today, he, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't judge him from today. He's uh, he's jet lagged. Normally, yeah. he's no. But you really are like you have an ability to. Again, it goes kind of back to like ego and kind of calming a person's insecurities and and having. I've just watched you so many times challenge somebody in a way where they don't actually know they're being challenged because they don't feel like you're challenging them. Mm. You know, they always feel like you're on their team. Um, and it's a it's a way that you have about words and the, and through <laughs> language, mm. surprisingly. <laughs> yeah, I think I think uh, yeah, that's very kind. Thank you. Um, 
Because <laughs> we've done a lot of movies together other than this movie. So I've watched you do this with different directors and over the years. Like, I think listening is a big deal. I think listening is a humongous part of what the collaborative process is like. So I think I try, for example, uh, with Moonlight, in pre-production, I you know I visited Miami before for I don't know, years earlier, just on a vacation I think with my family earlier. But uh, so the, when I got there for the film, the first thing I did was try to when we went to location scout. I wouldn't even take a camera with me. I would just kind of walk around, and when we would meet people, just listen to this, what they wanted to give to me and. Whatever they way that like whatever whatever the conversation was was going to happen, the hope was to let Miami speak to me. And I guess the same way you could say it's the same way I collaborate with directors is at the very beginning the hope is to act like a sponge and just sort of a, you know let them tell me what they feel their story is first, and then I can start to chime in a little bit. It's a hard thing. I don't. I have no obviously way of talking about how to get to know someone quickly. Um, Clearly, but with a drink, yeah, maybe. <laughs> sure. Alcohol can help actually a collaboration. <laughs> That's true. I do have a yeah. funny rule where I won't work with the director. I haven't had a drink with, like I have to kind of see what comes out of a person once they've had <laughs> it's true. like two beers and yeah. then go, all right, I'm ready for, I'm ready for when the monster, you know, I've, I've seen a glimpse of what's possible and I'm ready to like get married. Let's go, you mm. know? <laughs> Yeah. So, but but James, I mean, now the question was from a director, of course. Yeah. But if you take it from your viewpoint as a, a cinematographer, how do you communicate your vision to the director? Yeah, I mean, I don't have. The, the, I, I probably work in the same way many cinematographers do: I, sharing images, paintings, clips, movies, and just try to start on a, a visual vocabulary in that way, which is very common, I think. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the beginning of the conversation. And then, um, you know, it's funny, a music helps a lot for me. Barry, when Barry sends me those playlists and I oftentimes ask other directors to send me the things that they would write to, I think it helps a lot for me. And I, it's something I ask, I ask everyone to do. There's something about music that gives me a very quick cut to the chase version of what tone we're going towards. Um, so that's that's a that's something that has always always helped me a great deal. So is it like feeling like this is how you want to feel watching the movie? So now I yeah. know. Yeah, it's tempo as well. How tempo. You want, yeah. I think you know. I think that speaks to me about a lot about how quickly or slowly or calmly or erratically the camera moves. Um, can come a lot from tempo of, of song, I think, for me. Just very fast. If you yeah. don't think the same thing, if you disagree. Uh, that's the fun part, really. Um, I think that's the fun part. I, I, you know, I, I always think of myself as a, um, a tool for the director to use. That's my role. I'm a tool. <laughs> <laughs> So I try to just be the best tool I can be. And it's very simple. <laughs> I'm going to keep going. And uh, <laughs> um, that, I didn't realize that joke would, trans, would translate very well. Uh, it, land, um, it landed. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I don't mean to say that I was just defer and I say, whatever you want, sir, or whatever we want, ma'am. I don't, I don't think I just do that. But I definitely see myself as someone who wants to make their movie, not my movie. You're malleable. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I think that's true. I'll definitely... Or I'm trying to help you with this Thank metaphor, you very much. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll, if I feel very passionately about something, I'll make sure that I'm heard. I'll make sure that I've, I've communicated what I'm looking to present to someone before I'm just dismissed. But I don't fight that hard if it's not something that's working for someone you know the director has a thousand ways to communicate they have their actors they have the truck design the editing comes later the song and all those things i'm one of those things so if i'm not working for a director if what i'm offering isn't what they're looking for that doesn't i don't i'm not fierce about that that, that has to go away again going back to because well, it's always there ultimately it's the director's film right absolutely so in in success yeah. or in failure like yes yeah and when you said the music helps a lot, of course, it makes you wonder what was on Barry's playlist. I have it. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Read us a what couple of things. I'll turn, my, I'll turn my phone on. Hold on. 
Uh, oh, that's on my phone on real quick. It's, it's just Wait, I want to know. Okay, okay, okay. What was your film that was it can? Uh, it was called Push It. It's a short, so it's not a feature. And the new short is now in Berlin. Oh, cool. Yeah. But what was it called? It was called Push It. Push, Push It. Push It, Push it. Okay. was the one in Cannes. Yeah. Uh, okay. And now uh, let's go to Fanny and then to Danielle. Yeah, I have a very practical question about the lightning. Mm. So, also director? Uh, because uh, when I watched the film, um, as I remember, it was a while ago, but that like there's a lot of lightning, especially when they're alone, when it's like the scenes with one or two people in the room. <laughs> and like, because you say you had like quite low budget. So I j I'm just like wondering, when you were in school, in that kind of scenes, like on the street, in the schools, how big was your lightning team? <laughs> and like, how, how big was the team? And how did you work to like afford the big light for the mm. small scenes? Yeah. Mm. Um, you should talk about that beach scene. Cause that yeah, there's was, two things, right? Because I think yeah. for the school scenes and a lot of the interiors and homes, etc., the team was very small, and the hope and the plan collectively was that um, when we could afford to be very small, we would be as small as we possibly could be because there was a couple scenes in the film that I was very nervous about. And one of them was the beach scene, for example, and I knew that that was going to be somewhere With him where, holding... Uh, there's that story, I apologize, the, the nighttime one the nighttime, uh, in yeah. story two, and I knew that was going to be just like... For our scope, huge. I had, mm. So it's a significant scene. So I had to sort of, you know, budget accordingly and plan accordingly to make, knowing full well that I would be like over budget on one part, I would be under budget on another. So it was a flexible team that was, I think, like, a, for lighting. Lighting is different or structurally here than it is in the U.S. We have uh, electrics and grips, right? But I think you guys basically just use electrics. So, like, like that's, so we, I think the lighting team on both those departments for us was something like four people when we were doing the smaller scenes. And then when we were doing the bigger scenes, it was like 10 or 12 people probably. Wow. We were two and two on that show. <laughs> See, she doesn't wow. Yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think... Yeah, that's basically the structure of it. The small scenes, four people, and then bigger scenes, 10 or 12 or something like that. So it never got huge. I mean, um, I think we were still understaffed for <laughs> the beach nighttime scene. But, um, but uh, yeah, that was the idea, was to organize it that way, structure it that way. But you always had, like, big lights, or did you ever work with just small? Yeah, of course, oh, for sure. I mean... Um, very popular in today's photography are these LED lights now that are very popular, and we definitely employed them to great effect on the smaller scenes, for sure. I mean, those scenes, for example, the hallway scene with uh, the mother with the pink light coming back through the bath, the, the bedroom, and I think... The, where it's silent, but she's... Yeah, exactly. That, I think... I mean, there's, that pink light, for example, is a, 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 an LED light made by Light Gear. Um, and I think there's a, probably a total of, like three lights playing in that scene for both sides of the conversation. So it's pretty small. <laughs> um, and then for the big beat scene, it was a whole thing. <laughs> okay, let's Bigger. get the mic to Daniel there in the middle. Hello, uh, thank you for the movie. It's, it's a masterpiece. So I just want to ask a question about the, um, because I think the, the, uh, the way that the movie is uh, told and, uh, and also uh, the Visual narration is very eclectic, and uh, but still it has a very firm tone of, of itself, and and I think it's very interesting represented in the first scene. I, and I just wonder what your thoughts were because you're beginning uh, a movie, you know, and uh, and the first person you see is not your main character; is this other guy, and uh, and um, and um, and you meet this uh, other person and you find out what is working with and uh, more or less a bit of what kind of person he is and then uh, in the background somebody runs by and then the camera follows that person and that is our main character and, and that's fine but but then also visually <laughs> no but i mean then also visually uh, the first scene is is this beautifully uh, uh, choreographed uh, one shot mm. that is uh, you know I mean, extremely hard to do, and uh, and it's a very kind of decisive visual idea that doesn't reoccur in the picture later on, and uh, and then after that, when you cut to your main character, 
uh, after doing this kind of uh, very uh, grandiose uh, representation of this first person, uh, it's a very um, cotty uh, uh, scene that comes afterwards. And, and I think it's absolutely perfect and brilliant. And I just wonder, how did you, when did you ever come up with the idea to, to uh, have such a uh, daring opening, both from the producer side, but also visually, as a cinematographer, when did you and Barry come up with the idea to start with this one shot? Can you come with us as we travel around <laughs> to uh, explain that? Because I think the truth is that what you describe is exactly what we wanted to have happen. And I feel like that's not often discussed in the way you did. So um, I think, you know, I guess collect, to speak with the film generally, I go back to a, quickly uh, the idea of immersiveness and trying to create a, a film that has a experiential uh tone to it and less so an observant one so that choreographed piece was all about sort of well the intention was to try to take the room full of audience members and make them immediately feel like they have to they're not there's no choice they have to let go of of um any sense of judgment upon what they think this movie is going to look like I think we, I think the, I'm not sure here, but in the US, when we, she talked about it earlier, this idea of like poverty porn, we've seen stories about characters similar to, to Moonlight told a very different way than this film is. And um, the hope was with that first shot to immediately take away any thought from the audience as to what they thought this film was going to be. Uh, and then to cut directly to what the next scene is that you talk about. Um, was to sort of say, no, 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 here's the language of the movie. Um, it's, you, th you may have thought it was this spinny music video <laughs> thing. Uh, actually, no, no, it's, <laughs> it's this other thing. Um, so it was about just trying to disarm the audience, to like have hopefully let, have them let go of anything they came to the theater with and spend the next 90 minutes enjoying these characters. Yeah? <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. So let's take the one uh, up there. My name's Georgina. I work as a first AD. Yeah. Um, I just firstly want to say thank you for making such a wonderful movie. I think it's been a very long time since I've seen a film mm. that really understands and utilizes the aesthetics of cinema to convey empathy so deeply. It's lovely. So thank you. Um, obviously, when you work on a set, not every day is fun. <laughs> it's very hard sometimes and you, some days you just really do feel like throwing in the towel and giving up. And I just want to ask both of you, because when that happens, you really have to remember and go back to the reason why you began this in the first place and why you truly love the project you're doing. And you really have to, you know, almost get back to why you're all here working, you know, ridiculously long hours in horrible conditions sometimes. So I want to ask what it is that you look for when you're given a project, any project, even if it's not with a person that you work with regularly, and what it is that you're looking to jump out at you to keep you going and to fall in love with on those days when it is really, really tough to make a film. That's for both of you. <laughs> Um, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, we've all, we've all had those days or, or, you know, too many of those days, but, um, for me, you know, it's, it's always about the script. Uh, it doesn't matter how much I like a person or how talented I think they are. If the script isn't something that continues to haunt me in the passing days and weeks after reading it, then, um, I, I don't, I can't. You know, it has to be something that I'm still thinking about, uh, you know, the next week or, or two weeks later. Um, and I think we, we talk about this a lot. So, so Barry and myself and then two other uh, partners, one of which whom we went to film school with, are a company now called Pastel. And when we talk about new projects inside of the company, there's a lot of things that come through that, like, it could be good. And, like, it could be good is not good enough like we it has to be something that that is aspirationally great 
And of course, a thousand things can happen between the moment you decide to do it and you finish it that could um, derail that you know uh, achievement. But it has to be at least initially striving towards something truly great. Um, and it really, for me, is about script. And then, of course, like I don't really want to work with assholes. So if it's a great script, but the mm-hmm. filmmaker is maybe uh, kind of... I don't know, a jerk, then I don't, then I won't get involved with that either. Cause it's too, life is too short, but that's for me. Yeah. Um, it's hard. Uh, yeah. So first of all, thank you. Um, I think for me, I hope that I'm looking for, it's a feeling I think is at the end of the day. Uh, it's a, it's not, narrative per se for me sometimes it's more just to hope whether it's reading a script or in a first meeting with someone that they can uh, express upon me some sense of a unknown that combined with a sense of emotion gives me some sense of excitement Um, I think that's sort of a combination of things that check a box for me in a way that allows me to remember when those moments are happening. It's, it, it, it's a two-parter, because I think what you're asking a little bit is how to find those projects, and then also when you're in the project, what keeps you going. So the first bit is sort of that unknown adventure into an emotional chord that I'm looking for, and then when you're there, it's just all about sort of um, uh, the moment Barry or whoever calls cut, and you can... You just sort of, your shoulders go down and you you just experience something that was kind of magic. And I don't know how else to say besides that. There's a sense of like um, a really special moment that this room shared. I think that's what makes me go back to work the next day. That sense of like, that was a really special, unique thing that happened right then. And I was there for it, <laughs> you know, yeah. So let's take um, the guy in the white uh, hat. Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Andreas, and this question is for Mr. Laxton. Um, I'm wondering your choice of camera, mm. since this is a very small budget, do you have to have the Alexa, or could you choose another camera? Say that with- into the Alexa right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or could you choose another camera ah. and save a little bit money to maybe use... Uh, bigger lighting rigs, uh-huh. maybe a, ca- uh, a crane, yeah. or you know, for something else that visually needs to be for the story. Yeah. Let's say you use a Sony camera instead, F55. Uh-huh. Or do you have to have like an Alexa? <laughs> uh, they'll use this, I think, later on in promotional videos later. <laughs> <laughs> um, First of all, what camera did you use? Yeah, we used the Alexa yeah. on Moonlight. It was the um, the XT because before it was during the moments where to do anamorphic, you couldn't. The Mini had didn't have uh, the ability to do it yet, so we were on the big X, Alexa XT. And I would add to his question: Did you have to have the Alexa sixty five <laughs> on if Beale Street could talk? <laughs> we just yeah, we just shot the new one on the Alexa sixty five, which was amazing. That camera is amazing. Um, um, I did have to have it. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I think, so, I don't know, for the way I value things, for me, um, I, it obviously clearly depends on the project, a film like Moonlight, and also the film like we just worked on, the, and I think maybe with Barry generally, we always put format before any other choice. Format lens, I think, is, is the first thing we choose before uh, even like what language we're using. Steadicam, Crane, whatever tools come after, the camera choice is every single time so far anyway, always been the first one. Um, so that's where we start our deconstruction process to knowing, to figuring out the technical parts of our jobs. Um, so I guess the answer is kind of, yeah, I, I, I do, I do need, I do need, I did need that Alexa. Um, and it, but it, I, that's not to t- take away from anything anybody else offers. I mean, there's beautiful aspects to this, that 55, um, there's beautiful aspects to the Varicam. It's a tool to use, and it's as simple as that. There's not, it just speaks to me, and it allows me to express myself in a way that I'm very proud of. But that doesn't mean that anything other, other than that is not as good. I don't view, I don't view these things as like hierarchical processes. Um, there's projects that are best suited for Betacam. 
Mm. <laughs> <laughs> there are. I think that's very, very true. I, I you know, it's. Uh, I just shot, no I shot a commercial. That. I, don't know. I shot a commercial last year on Vidicam. It was great. It was actually my favorite thing. <laughs> Okay, let's take the next question, the guy behind. <laughs> I'm Nils, a cinematographer, and I had a question regarding the three-part hello, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the three-part structure of the movie. How did you decide to work both production-wise and creatively, like how to differentiate each of the parts and how to also keep them within the same world? Mm. Well, I mean, the logistics of it, we, we tried our best to sort of create this three-short film structure to the schedule. Um, and then, of course, you know, big fancy actors like Naomi Harris uh, and, and Mahershala. Is it true she shot only three days? It's true. So yeah. her schedule got a little bit complicated. She was promoting the James Bond movie at the time. And um, then her visa was also a little bit of a challenge. Um, so we ended up having to compress her, her schedule to those three shooting days. So in those three days, we did jump around in time. Um, but outside so of that, so it's the woman playing the mother. Yeah. yeah, and I think what did we? We ended up shooting the the rehab scene, which is her third third act scene. The same day we shot the scene from the first act, where she and Ali confront each other mm -hmm. in the projects at the nighttime scene, where yeah. he, he, he discovers her using crack. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so like to go from that scene in the morning to that scene at night, as a, as an actress, as mm. I have so much respect for her, um, and so. We, we tried to do it as short film, short film, short film, to the best of our ability. But then, as far as... I mean... So the question was differentiating, yeah. but still keeping them. Officially, for, yeah, for us, I think, for Bear and I, in terms of our, our, our process, I think we were actually way more worried about it looking too dissimilar, uh, less so trying to make it distinct. Um, we definitely did use certain tools more predominantly in others than in, in one story than in other stories. But for example, we use handheld dolly instead of cam in each of the stories. Just one maybe tool more than another in, in each one, just to sort of go about uh, what we felt like was an internal emotional thread. Um, for, you know, quickly. For example, um, in the third story, where we where we were with black, I think we're mo mostly dolly and sticks. And in that sort of story, we just felt as if he would he had sort of become something and a bit more rock steady. And then in story two, he's more of a teenager and we're steady coming around and it's a fluidity to it. And then one, we're a bit more handheld. So there's a little bit of that going on. But I think we were, again, go back to the original answer, which is we wanted to make a movie. We didn't want to make three short, short films. And the idea was to kind of create a, a thread more so than a differentiation. <laughs> Hi, my name is Marek. I'm a cinematographer. Uh, thank you for an amazing film. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, about um, something that I think was a big thing, but the film became so powerful, is that it has a strong subjective language. Yeah. Uh, the subjectivity in the film makes you come extremely close to the characters. And um, I noticed also that you very often place the camera more in the space between the actors. Yeah. Um, not, that's more sort of common being outside yeah. Yeah. the action. And I think that was very beautiful. Uh, so I'd like to, if you can yeah. speak a little about that. I mean, that's, I think what you, you, your preface was the exact thing we were thinking about was just trying to make it a, a real sense of perspectives that you're you're in you're in those characters. You're not watching those characters, and I think that was the whole concept behind our visual language was just that. Those are the cornerstones for what we were doing for sure. Um, it's funny, you know. I think yeah, I, very common today. And Barry is one of the only directors that I work with that does that. Is um, put, putting putting the camera between people can sometimes be a challenging thing, especially for actors who would like the sense to sort of be free and engage with the other actor in the room. And uh, what he does and what I, I, I really appreciate him for it is he puts me in the conversation between them and it becomes this, it just the dynamic shifts completely. And all of a sudden the actors are talking to the audience now. And when they, when, and that is a very powerful tool that, uh, you know, it just it goes, it definitely goes un, untapped, I think, uh, especially for some reason in modern cinema. It's not something we use very often. And, um, uh, it's, I think it's funny. We did it on the, on a little bit different than in Moonlight on the new movie. And I think, you know, certain actors have a harder time with it than others, but 
um, once they sort of see, once I think you can bring them, what happen, What I think happens, I mean, this is me thinking about what an actor thinks about, but what I, what I think happens oftentimes is they, it's, it maybe is confusing and hard, but the moment that they understand it, it gives them all of a sudden this license to express themselves in a way that it opens them up performance-wise. And I think it's really interesting from my perspective for working with Barry for so long and uh, to watch them figure it out, it's actually really interesting. And uh, I think in a way, while it at first becomes in, uh, something that is inhibiting, all of a sudden it becomes very freeing. Um, it's just, yeah, it's interesting. I, I, it's a, it clearly worked for Moonlight, and uh, it's a powerful tool that, when used appropriately, is, is good. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the project you're working on now. If uh, Beale Street could talk, it's based on a James Baldwin novel. Um, and you're working again with Barry. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, the project. Yeah, Where are you now in the process? Ba Barry's new film. We did it with our friends at Plan B again. Um, Nat and Joy are our editors again. Nick Bertel, our composer, composer yeah. Caroline so the Eflin, our, the, We got the band back together. <laughs> Even the gaffer from Moonlight came with us um, and the makeup artist. <laughs> Uh, it's so yeah. It's an adaptation of the Baldwin novel "If Beale Street Could Talk," which um, isn't his great, great most known work, but um, oddly, it's the only one of his works that's been adapted for um, screen. And this is once in in France in the '90s, I think, but but got very far away from the original text. And then this is the first. Uh, you know, U.S. theatrical adaptation of a Baldwin work. So we're very which is really odd, actually. It's but a great, it's a great Negro honor. Was based I think. on his texts as well, the documentary, right? That's just Baldwin. Well. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's not. I don't think it's based on his text. Per se. There's like some, I think, some essays or some letters yeah, or something some that they access yeah. for that film. Um, so, so that. But so, no fiction, all stories. No, but I mean, Raoul did yeah. have to work with the estate on that. But um, yeah, it's a great honor that they um, allowed us the license to adapt yeah. it and. Uh, I don't know how much we can say about it because we are only a, f a few weeks into Barry's um, cut of the film. Mm. When we, do you expect it to be ready? Uh, I think fall for this year. Yeah, mm. we don't have a date set, but um, we shot it around the same time of year that we shot Moonlight. Mm. And so, you know, theoretically, we could finish it around the same time that we finished Moonlight. Mm. So yeah. how has it uh, affected... Uh, now you have the band back together again, but... Now it's the band that made Moonlight. <laughs> so what's what's the biggest difference in the in that process? Then? Um, well, I think something that was really special about making Moonlight is that nobody was paying attention uh, to the film being made. Like it was so far under the radar, people had largely forgotten about Barry as a, a filmmaker, and it was a you know mil, you know million and a half dollar movie. So it just wasn't really on anybody's mind and we were allowed to very quietly go away to Miami, make this film, finish it, and then sort of introduce it as a finished piece and, and people made their opinions of it. But um, this time, it, obviously, it's not so quiet. <laughs> um, <laughs> there are some expectations, maybe. <laughs> there are maybe some expectations. And so, I mean, I think that we just try to remember um, not to let that noise uh, interfere with our process. <laughs> And to kind of try as much as possible to, you know, bring it back to its core in terms of how we work together and our values and, and why we're, you know, why we're choosing to make this story together and not get too distracted by the things on the Twitter and the internet and whatever. So The Twitter. The Twitter. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that was a special thing that I don't know if we'll ever be allowed to have that again, sort of the um, an under the radar feeling. Mm. I feel like it's a more succinct word that I can't, that's escaping me right now, but that feeling of just sort of being low key, like I don't know if we get to have that again. Um, but sad, yeah. But we got to have more money, so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mm. Yeah. Mm. James had a bigger lighting team. A few more people. <laughs> exactly. How many were it this time? Around? I mean, I think this. <laughs> I think the smallest was about the biggest last time. So, mm -hmm. and then we went bigger than that, even for certain scenes. Um, no, it's. I, I think it's hard. It, but I think you know, going back to the very first part of our conversation today, to work with people that you're familiar with helps a lot. Um, 
And, you know, I think we're, at, we're all able to cut, our, cut each other off at the knees a little bit and get away with it still, even today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think that, that that's helpful to, to say, to cut away the noise or whatever, to have people that um, remind you to shut up or whatever. It's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And you can't take any of it for granted, I think. It's a nice moment right now um, because expectations are high and people are willing to believe, you know, in, in what we'll do next. But that can always change. If they don't like the next movie, then we're back where we started. So I think it's also important to, to keep that perspective and just, like, always remember your core values and, and who your people are because... Mm-hmm. It's a tide, and it and it's ever changing. So also, it's insane. I'm also a, I'm a pessimistic person. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, last year was so. I mean, I it was uh, just an insane few months um, on a personal level that make it just. I don't know that that, that version of the the, the campaign, all the bizarreness of whatever that is. Um, it it'll shake you in a way that makes you forget about what's important. And then the, what was cool about coming back to Beale Street was um, refinding that center of yourself as well with the people that keep you balanced. And I think that's that's something that we felt, I felt I was very lucky to have in that in this partnership, you know? Yeah, Yeah, because a lot of times success, it sort of tears people apart, you know? And um, we literally got pretty much everybody back together to yeah. go do... Well, that really... Ruin the sentiment of that nice statement, but, <laughs> but you know where I was going with it. So, so I think yeah. um, we need to to wrap this up. I, I just want to really wish you good luck for tomorrow. Thank you. thank you. Thanks very much. And thank you so much for coming. Yeah, our pleasure. Thank, thank you, you very, very, very much, guys. Thank you.